Thank you. Um, well, what Crystal and I are going to do um, in the next half hour or so is to have a discussion about the field. But I thought before we get started, just for those people who are not that familiar with the uh, CAR T therapy field, I'll just spend a couple of minutes of introduction and then we can get into some questions and hopefully some discussions with the audience. Oh, I need the thingy. So you've already heard from the previous speaker that uh, T cell therapies have taken on a very um, active role in, in recent years, uh, starting with uh, TIL therapies back in the, in the 90s by people like Steve Rosenberg, and now more recently the engineered cells that have been created using either T cell receptors or more recently these chimeric antigen receptors. And as was already mentioned, um, the, the big advances here have not just been the ability to take advantage of T cell receptors isolated, cloned, and re-engineered into cells, but this whole new field, it's not so new, it started back uh, 40 years ago, um, but a field of CAR T cell therapy, which really takes advantage of the fact that monoclonal antibodies have a great degree of specificity and affinity and can be attached to the signaling end of a T cell receptor uh, um, complex, and when done, will deliver a signal that will activate the T cell and allow it to kill or make cytokines against uh, tumors. And so typically what happens is cells are removed from individuals, they're expanded, activated, engineered, and then put back in um, against the target of interest. And the, the first target to make its way all the way through to an approved drug, um, and you'll hear more from Crystal about where we're going from here on this target was CD19. Uh, it's a ex molecule expressed on all B cells, but also a number of um, blood leukemia cells, including ALL. And uh, several groups showed that you could, in fact, attach an anti-CD19 antibody to uh, either a, um, an intracellular uh, set of domains that includes the T cell receptor zeta chain and either the CD28 or the 41BB and both of those deliver effective uh, mechanisms for activation of cells. And the first, uh, the first uh, very successful uh, example of this was Emily Whitehead at the University of Pennsylvania when Carl June treated her. What was interesting about, um, about her response was that in fact she had the cytokine storm that we all worry about, but through um, treatment with, uh, with immunosuppressive uh, anti-cytokine antibodies and Good, good care, she survived and is now alive um, many, many years later. And in fact, it was based on this early work that the first drug was approved, uh, Novartis's drug, and then more recently, the kite drug. So this has been an, an explosive field. There are pioneers in these fields that have led the way, but it really, as you can just see from this graph, the explosion of what's taken place uh, just over uh, the last few years, and I believe that we'll be looking back in, in 10 years and, and, and looking at cell therapy as really the next pillar of medicine after small molecules and biologics. And I remember back to the OKT3 days, um, working on that molecule early on and being told that monoclonal antibodies will never make it as drugs because they're too expensive and hard to make. So anyone who tells you that cell therapy is not going to make it is living in a, in a I think, a, a past world. So um, it's even more clear now that that explosion is taking place in the commercial sector as well. It's a little less than five years ago now that, uh, that we could find no companies that were really actively working in the field, and now there are dozens, and they're working on autologous T cells. They're trying to develop um, off the shelf, which we'll talk a little bit more about, that can be used in anybody. Receptor regulation, so we can turn on, turn off receptors and alternative cell types. T cells aren't the only potential effector cell. You can think about other cells like NK cells, even macrophages and neutrophils and other cell types, which can play important immunotherapy roles. So um, that's where we are today. Uh, they have many challenges, however, remain, and we're gonna turn our attention to those uh, challenges. They include how do we develop therapies that are efficacious with solid tumors? How do we get the cells into the solid tumor mass? How do we get them to persist in this highly immunosuppressive and toxic tumor microenvironment? How do we avoid the off-target effects that I think have, uh, have in some cases challenged um, some of the 
uh, the, the targets that we've chosen for the CARS therapy. Um, sometimes it's off target, sometimes it's on target and off tissue. How do we manage the side effects and how do we get these costs down with the uh, first couple of drugs clo close to half a million dollars uh, just to get the drug and then a million dollars probably of hospital care. So these are challenges that have to be addressed. So as I said, I'm very lucky today um, to be with Crystal Mackle, who is uh, really one of the pioneers in using uh, CD19 cars, especially in, in kids, and being able to demonstrate uh, its activity in uh, pediatric leukemia. Crystal is um, the director of the Parker Institute for Cancer Immunotherapy at Stanford, uh, and also has uh, several other titles uh, at, at the university, having moved from uh, the NIH a few years ago, and it was able to be here today because she's no longer closed down by the government um, and, and could come. So um, I guess um, I'll start the conversation, Crystal, with maybe you can tell us all a little bit about um, how you got into the cell therapy field and what was it that really excited you about it? Yeah. Uh Thanks, Jeff, and it, it's a pleasure to be here, and I do feel like I should say we had hoped to have Hy Levitsky with us, but uh, some things went on today around Juno Therapeutics that people might be following, and, it, and he wasn't able to make it. So, um, you know, I've been doing cancer immunotherapy since, you know, the early 80s, really, since very early in my medical career, and that involved both, you know, trying to develop new therapies, but also treating patients. I'm a practicing Physician, So, you know, you can kind of see with your own eyes how these things work. And um, the fact is that although there's been a lot of immunotherapies come down the pike, what I have seen in terms of the potency and persistence potential of cell therapies, there just hasn't been anything like it. And especially when you're talking about classes of uh, diseases like childhood cancers, which, you know, just don't be behave the same way as adult cancers, uh, this has been the only thing uh, that has been able to touch them in terms of immunotherapy. So um, it's an obvious question I get asked a lot of time, why bother with T cells? Can't you just give checkpoints and off the shelves and buy specifics and this and that? But I have not seen anything else that has the potency and persistence of cellular therapies. And turns out CAR T cells, you know, give us the opportunity to engineer it to almost any cancer of interest. So I think that we all really are looking at the tip of the iceberg, Jeff, in terms of what, you know, what this field's gonna become, as you, as you alluded to. So Crystal, if you were a, a patient today, right, with the, um, we just heard about bispecifics, we've heard a lot about checkpoint inhibitors, and you're looking at cell therapy as, a, as an opportunity as we go forward. Given the, the, the interesting differences in terms of it being a live drug, going in and, and hanging around maybe for decades, being some of the, the challenges that, that have come up. How do you see the public taking um, advantage of cell therapy in the future? Will it be a equal off the shelf kind of platform as some of the other therapies? Or do you see it as a more targeted personalized medicine? You know, at this meeting, we're talking a lot about precision medicine and how do you see this going forward? Yeah, I mean, with all the investment that you, aptly showed there, I don't think this is going to be a one-size-fits-all therapy. Um, you know, we have the autologous CD19 car, and the case of Emily Whitehead is so poignant because she was treated when she fought, was five years old. She's 11 years old now, and her CAR T-cells are still circulating in her system and surveying any CD19 positive cell that arises. So this is sort of the purist's dream, right? Uh, you take a product, it is specific for a particular antigen that is compatible with uh, living a healthy life, and it uh, selectively eradicates your cancer. So that's one model, and that model costs right now $475,000 uh, to administer. Now that'll come down, but the fact is that there are gonna be other shapes and sizes of these things. There are gonna be targets where you're not gonna want you know, the T cell seeing this for five years, so you're gonna wanna regulate these things, or you're gonna wanna engineer uh, transients. Um, and once you start to accept that maybe cellular therapies that aren't this purest version can have use, then you start talking about allogeneic products off the shelf and K cells. You're going to have a whole array of these things. Um, they're not all going to look like the autologous, you know, CAR T that we're talking about today. 
So, so let's get into a little bit about what, what I highlighted as some of the challenges and opportunities as you see it. I, I, I think that it's pretty clear that the, the, the next big advance is going to be successful treatment of solid tumors. And the work by Bluebirds suggests that BCMA might be a very good target. But there are still all kinds of challenges, as we've heard about, in the solid tumor space. Uh, you, you, you gave me a slide, which maybe you'll want to refer to. But it really, I think, highlights um, what are some of the challenges in that space. So maybe you could speak to how do you think we're going to actually approach the solid tumor in a more um, uh, yeah. successful way? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it, that B cell malignancies have been such a leading edge for monoclonal antibodies, by specifics, and now you've got CAR T cells. And, and you know, as uh, cancer, in some ways, they're fairly simple because you get these lineage-specific antigens that are highly expressed and homogenous, and you, know, you have accessible tumors that maybe don't have the organized microenvironment. Uh, so we get to learn the rules by studying the B-cell malignancies. And it seems to me that in the solid tumors, the, the major problems can be divided into two pieces. The first is the target, and the second is the microenvironment. And you know, I think the microenvironment gets a lot of uh, attention, and it should. And the great thing about the microenvironment is that there are so many ways we can go after the microenvironment. We can either engineer cell autonomous, you know, resistance to immunosuppressive mediators, you know, CRISPR out, you know, receptors for TGF beta or what have you, or we can even think about using combinatorial therapies, the same agents that are being developed to make checkpoint inhibitors work better by impacting suppression in the microenvironment are likely to be able to make CAR T cells work better. So I. I'm, I think that that field is going to evolve sort of uh, just as the larger field of cancer immunotherapy evolves. I think the area that maybe hasn't gotten as much um, focus and remains a bigger challenge perhaps is the target issue. Um, and you know, we still are just learning the rules about what are the characteristics of a target that make it a good target for, CD9, for uh, CAR T cell. We've all been worried to death that maybe CD19 was unique. Was there something about it? Um, the good news is that our group has now demonstrated that CD22 appears to be an equally effective target in leukemia. Um, as you mentioned, the BCMA data is really reassuring that there are going to be numerous targets that we can uh, go after. But when you turn to a solid tumor, you're looking for a target that's highly overexpressed and not expressed at sufficient levels on normal tissue. So all of a sudden, you know, you don't have as many to choose from. Uh, so we have to get more sophisticated around targets. We have to start talking about logic gates. We have to understand the therapeutic window. I personally believe our data from our laboratory demonstrates that there may be a therapeutic window for some of the targets that we've been afraid of, because it looks like CAR T cells actually have a fairly high uh, requirement for antigen in order to fire. Um, so I'm very interested in seeing the field take some more chances on some of the targets. But you can't do that unless you have more sophisticated machines. You can't put a machine into a person that goes from zero to 60 with no regulation when you're starting to go after these what I call tricky targets. Um, so we'll see the field get more, uh, uh, they'll take more risks, but as we have more sophistication around our cell engineering, and that's when I, I think we'll start to see uh, the real signal in solid tumors. So it's interesting, you, 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 you pivoted us to targets, which I think is really important. One of the things that Ira Melman said this morning was one of the, I think, great um, um, sort of successes about checkpoint inhibitors was the durability and the fact that you changed the tail. For those people that respond, it was long term. And I think one of the arguments for that is that you get epitope spreading, you get multiple uh, T cell specificities. I think in, the, in, the, in, in, in your field, what we're now noticing is that there are a significant number of patients that actually escape the treatment and start downregulating the molecule and, and selecting against it. In fact, I, yeah. a little bit of your own data, again, uh, really shows what happens here when you start you know, selecting for tumors that have lost CD19. So how do you see us dealing with this, uh, tum this antigen escape, this, uh, this yeah. uh, uh, loss of target? Yeah, and <clears throat> again, this is where we start to think about one size might not fit all in terms of engineered T cells. Um, for a 
engineered T cell that's going to go after B cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia. It, it's our general impression that we have to eradicate every last cell or cell. That the cell, it, the cell you're engineering has to be capable of eradicating every last cell. And for whatever reason, with B cell leukemia, that requires prolonged exposure. Um, it's kind of interesting. Clinically, this disease, you treat a patient who comes in with a packed marrow, you give them cytotoxic chemotherapy. At 28 days, if all goes well, they're in remission. That means you can't find a leukemia cell. And at that point, you say to the child, now you're going to begin three years of chemotherapy. It's a very strange thing. What are we treating? Some kind of stem cell in the marrow. Well, it turns out that for CAR T cells, it looks like the rules are somewhat similar. If you don't have a long tail, on your CAR T cell, these leukemias are going to recur. And so um, it, it's such that we now have now a tumor that doesn't have very many other mutations. It doesn't appear to be inducing epitope spreading in this disease. And when they recur, they recur because they've lost that target most of the time. This could be very different in another disease. If you had a disease that had a lot of neoantigens and you put your CAR T cells in there and they only last a few weeks, you might have induced a whole plethora of, of other responses that might be sufficient. If you look at the literature around DLBCL, um, the kite data, um, in fact, not having a long tail on your CAR T cell has not seemed to impact what looks like long-term disease-free control. So it's a, you know, the biology of the disease matters. And there are gonna be some diseases where a short-acting cell is sufficient for whatever reason. And there are going to be other diseases like B-cell ALL where that cell has to do all the, all the work all the time. Should we be thinking about targets that actually are key to the viability or tumor genicity? When you think about HER2, for instance, yeah. you know, why did that antibody work so well? I think some people wonder whether in part that was because you, can't aff you couldn't afford to delete that antigen or modify it because it played such an important role in tumor genesis. Do you think the same thing is gonna be true in selecting CAR T targets? Well, we certainly uh, do everything we can to select a target that's required, but you know, it's very hard for everything to line up. Um, and you've got some like CD19 where it plays a role in B cell receptor signaling, but it's certainly not required, and yet, it's turned out to be a potent target. So yes, if everything else was, was equal, you would always pick that one. But I don't know if we always have the luxury of that. Mm -hmm. I noticed that, um, that a lot of the field now is moving towards uh, thinking about um, engineering the cells to make them more effective, whether it's payloads or regulation or knockouts. So I, I, I don't know, most people wouldn't have necessarily seen this, but there was a paper just a few weeks ago showing that if you knock out um, PD-1, that those T cells can become tumorigenic themselves. And so how much do you worry about all of this genetic manipulation of the T cell now actually leading to an uncontrolled response? Because you don't have the luxury of easily getting rid of these cells once you get them going. Yeah, I, I think, we're gonna look back in a decade and say, can you believe what we did with CD19 CAR? We put in this cell that went from zero to 60 and we had no way to control this thing. Um, the fun part of this field, the reason why I think it's just a blast to work in is because all of the engineering opportunities that are presenting themselves. Um, you know, the scientists have been toiling away with understanding how to regulate proteins and uh, creating switch molecules and molecular biology tricks. I mean, it's, it's just um, the number of variations on the theme. So um, we are going to be able to regulate these CAR T cells. And it's going to allow us to do a lot more things. And I think the surprise is going to come, this is my prediction, is that regulating these T cells is not only going to make them safer, but it's also going to make them more effective. Um, so yeah, I think you know, there, that was a scary paper, you know, knocking out PD-1 and causing a T cell to become malignant. But um, we would hope that we would have switches that would be able to delete these cells or we'd be able to attack them. So, Let me ask one last question, and then maybe we can open up for a few questions from the audience. It, it, um, you mentioned, I've mentioned that uh, right now this is a, a high cost uh, venture um, with 
upwards of a half a million dollars for the therapy right now. And even if it lasts forever, it's still a pretty big bolus of, of money. And, and in thinking about how we're going to reduce that cost, manufacturing efficiencies and the like, clearly the off-the-shelf cell is going to be uh, the way to go. And there are a number of groups now, companies, who are working on, on that. Um, where do you see that going, and what do you think are going to be the key challenges to creating a universal therapeutic that you can just put into anybody when you need it? Yeah. Boy, the impetus to do this is just, it's irresistible to almost everybody in the field. You know, even though, again, as a purist, you know, you kind of realize that that autologous cell that can persist for years is the holy grail, there are so many challenges around making that for every patient who needs it. And so then you begin to ask yourself, what are the trade-offs and what can I live with? I'm, I'm going to get back to this question of each disease is a little bit different. If for diffuse large B cell lymphoma, you really only need exposure of a few months of these cells, then now you begin to think, shoot, I could do this with an off-the-shelf uh, uh, product. And if I get sophisticated, you know, I may be able to get more than a few months. So um, it, it's going to come, Jeff. I don't know if it's ever going to be quite as good as an autologous, but it's going to come. It's going to be a different shape and size. And in certain diseases, I imagine it's going to have efficacy. So I think before I open it up to some questions, just a little bit of an advertisement here. Um, so as you heard at the beginning, I'm the CEO and president of the Parker Institute. And one of the things that we pride ourselves in is really getting the best and smartest scientists together to really take, um, take, take therapies to the next level, doing high risk, unmet needs. And the team we put together here is really rather extraordinary to help us do this. And I think this is a field where clearly there will be some benefits in collaboration, benefits to working um, as a team to try to do it. So if there's anyone out there in the audience who has an interest in this field and wants to uh, approach us, uh, that would be great. So let's just end the last few minutes. Uh, if anyone has any questions or anything you want to pose, Crystal is a wealth of knowledge of all things cell therapy, if anyone has any questions about this. Okay, looks like you did a great job. Well, thank you all okay, for your time. Thank you.